I can remember when I was I had an English teacher kept wear her glasses but when I look down and the words just look like they're running together it's not right no I remember in the seventh or eighth grade I had an English teacher who in an effort to teach us how to write more clearly and more effectively to what she the five W's. Who, and where, and why. In our time together this morning, I want us to look at perhaps the ultimate question, which is why. You see, I think it's a question that is simply ingrained in us as human beings. Why? We're hotwired to cause and effect everything. For example, we learned eons ago that if you strike two stones together, marks with the mouth. Cause and presume that you try to ride some woolly mammoth, well, possibly, again, cause and effect. Uh, you see, at a very early age, we're asking those questions, like, why is the sky blue? Why are there leaves on a tree? Why do we have to eat broccoli? Now, each and every individual who's ever had or uh, has had small children knows what it is like to hear the question, why? You also know that if you provide a reasonable answer, the very next question is, but why? It's a question that I think we continue to ask into adulthood. Uh, that is to say, we question silly things like, uh, why is it? That when we see a sign that says wet paint, we just have this incredible urge to touch it just to make sure, you know. We also have the frustrating stuff. Like why is it that I, every time I pull into a shorter line, the line that's the longest ends up beating me to where it is we're going? Why? But then there are those vast and unanswerable questions. Why? Questions about human suffering and human pain. There is the question like why that drunk driver swerved into that lane on that day in front of that car? Or why cancer cells started growing in that person? Or why a gunman entered a school on that particular day, went to that particular classroom, and began shooting indiscriminately at those who were inside the classroom? Why? Why do evil and suffering exist? And for those of us who are a people of faith, it's an especially troubling question. I mean, why do terrible things happen in a world that is supposedly governed by an all-powerful, all-knowing God that is great and good? Now, the fancy term for that question is theodicy, okay? And it's every pastor's biggest nightmare. Because, you see, if you're theologically responsible, you have to be willing to stand in front of your congregation and simply say to them, I don't know. I don't know. Modern theologian C.S. Lewis dealt with the very same question of why. You see, he lost his life to metastatic breast cancer. And out of his questions, that is, out of his why, he wrote the now famous book, A Grief Observed. And in that book, he said the following. 
Quote, sometimes, Lord, one is tempted to say that if you wanted us to behave like the lilies of the field, you might have given us an organization more like theirs, end quote. I don't have to tell you. Countless people are in pain, great pain. Perhaps it's pain from loss, pain from illness, pain from a hopeless heart. And we ask the question, why? We search for predictability and patterns. The problem is that, unfortunately, there is no uh, reason, clear cause and effect. And the Bible doesn't exactly give us crisp, clear answers either. You know, take the book of Job, for example. There, in that book, faithful Job is struck down for seemingly no reason and when he asks God why, God essentially says to him, listen, Job, this is a need-to-know basis, and you're not, you don't have the need to know. Reassuring. And then there's the story of Lazarus. Jesus gets word that his friend Lazarus is about to die, and rather than hurry to his side, well, Jesus just takes his own sweet time. Meanwhile, Lazarus dies. And when Jesus arrives, he raises Lazarus from the dead, and it makes the question, why? Why not just save Lazarus before he died in the first place? And while we're at it, Jesus, why didn't you save all the other people that are in that tomb as well? Why? Why? And unfortunately, if we're looking for clear causes and effect in the Bible, you're simply not going to get it. You know why? Because authors of Scripture didn't have the answers either. They simply didn't. And so they presented these great questions in the form of, of stories and parables and poetry. Working it out, just like all of us are, Trying to work it out for ourselves right here and right now. But here's the thing. It's okay to try and figure things out. Okay? It's okay to ask why. Dr. James Cone, who was a Methodist minister who once taught at Union Theological Seminary, uh, he had an interesting perspective on this. It seems that one day in class, uh, a student asked him, Dr. Cohn, how do you balance the need to ask why uh, with the need for a simple faith? Dr. Cohn looked at his student and explained they're one and the same. His answer was, quote, to question and to wonder is to simply love God with one's mind. Listen, we all experience tragedy. We all experience pain and loss. And sometimes it, we experience it in horrible and unexplainable ways. And yet we ask why. That's okay. Because you see, God gave us a brain to question. God gave us a brain to wonder. Okay? The trick is making sure you simply do not get stuck in that place of questioning. Okay? Here's the thing. If I don't care if you take, if you don't take anything else away from today's message, it's this. It's okay to ask why. But doubt and questioning are not the ultimate destination. Rather, it is simply a way station. At some point, we have to get moving again. And the key to moving forward is found in our text for this morning, which is a psalm that is familiar to each and every one of us, the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm, and, and, and here's the thing. 
most of you are aware that I typically use the New International Version. Uh, I have a couple of individuals that really like the King James Version. I'm not going quite back to the King James Version. I'm going to use the New King James Version. Uh, but this is the way the New King James Version reads Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now the reason I went to the New King James Version is because most of us growing up, we heard and learned the 23rd Psalm out of the King James Version. I wanted something that was familiar. Those of you who have heard me read this at funerals understand that when I tell people we're going to read a psalm of comfort, I'm also telling them that it is a psalm of confidence. Not just comfort, but confidence. Because you see, I'm always astounded at how relevant Scripture written over 2,000 years ago is to our modern day pain. Especially the line that says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Folks, that is a tremendous statement, not only of courage, but of faith. Now, in my past readings of that, I've tended to always focus on the line, I shall fear no evil. However, I read not long ago where someone said that he believed the most important word in Psalm 23 is the little word walk. You see, the psalmist did not say, yea, though I sit in the valley of death. The psalmist didn't say, yea, though I stand in the valley of death. Uh, The psalmist didn't even say, yea, though I am mired in the valley of death. The psalmist used the Hebrew word, which translated literally means walk Travel, go. In other words, when we focus on the word walk in Psalm 23, we realize that any time we find ourselves in the shadow of the valley of death, or the shadow of some huge obstacle, or the shadow of change and transition, the best and the only thing we can do is to simply keep walking. Just keep walking walking. Now, if you want to obsess over cause and effect, that's fine. But just keep walking. You want to be angry with God and yell at God about your pain or your misfortunes, that's fine. But just keep walking. If you want to go around asking why all the time, that's fine but just keep walking. Which may be leading you even now to ask the question, Terry, why? Why must we keep walking? It is because with movement comes meaning. The author, Rabbi Harold Kushner, lost his son at age 14 to a rare and horrible disease. But Rabbi Kushner rejected the idea that God was somehow responsible or even that there was some rational explanation for his suffering. As he writes in the book, let me suggest that bad things happen to us in our lives do not have a meaning when they happen to us, but... We can redeem those tragedies from senselessness by imposing meaning on them ourselves, end quote. 
after years of struggling with the why of what had happened to him, Rabbi Kushner took his pain and he imposed meaning on that pain by writing a book entitled When Bad Things Happen to Good People. I will tell you that is a book that has no doubt helped millions upon millions of people through loss like his. In short, what Rabbi Kushner did was he simply kept walking. And Rabbi Kushner's not alone. From the survivors of 9-11 to families of tragedies in schools or movie theaters or churches or concerts or wherever it might be. The families who have great loss through fires, hurricanes, tornadoes. To those tragedies, countless people have made the very difficult but bold decision to keep moving. To keep moving. Why? Because with movement comes meaning. And with meaning comes a reminder of the love that surrounds us. With meaning comes a reminder that you and I are to be grateful in all circumstances. And it's at this point that I do believe I need to add a caveat. Because we all know that storms come and go, okay? And we also know that it's quite easy once the storm has passed to simply begin taking things for granted once again. It hasn't been that long since you and I can remember having to wear masks everywhere we went, being isolated. In fact, shutting the doors to restaurants, movie theaters, churches. And, 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 and we didn't like it. You didn't like it. I didn't like it. And many of the places affected by the pandemic are now uh, seeing issues, continuing to see issues. But now that it's been some time, well, we've totally forgotten those things that we had to go through. And now we're back to taking life for granted. That was a young lady by the name of Laura Kelly Benucci who said it this way back in the summer of 2020. She said, when this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, full shelves at the store, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, a Friday night out, a taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, a stadium roaring, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday, life itself. How quickly we forget. You see, we have to keep walking because with movement comes meaning, and with meaning comes what? Gratitude. And to keep walking means that it will lead us to a path that will take us home. I want to end with this illustration. In 1995, the Academy Award for Best Short Documentary was for a movie entitled One Survivor Remembers. It was based on the life of a Holocaust survivor by the name of Gerda Klein. In her acceptance speech, Gerda told the story of being in a blizzard on one of the death marches. 
passing by homes with lights in the window and smoke rising from the chimneys. And she found herself wanting nothing more than to simply go home again. So she kept walking. Fifty years later, Gerda wrote a memoir and filled her survival story in order that she might remember those who never got home. And she ended into her acceptance speech with these words, quote, Allow me to ask you to do one simple thing. When you return to your home tonight, don't enter right away. Just pause for a moment and look at your house. Think about its warmth, its security. And think about the people inside, your family. Think about what they mean to you. And what blessings you possess, end quote. Listen, we have all been in that vortex at one time or another where we are simply trying to make sense of this crazy, crazy world. We have found ourselves in the vortex of feeling angry, feeling confused, resentful, finding ourselves asking the question after time and time again, why, why, why? But the cycle of questioning is not the ultimate destination. It's only a way station. For even in the places of greatest loss, love still surrounds us. And if you and I keep walking, Eventually, we will start to connect with our blessings of lights in the window and smoke rising from the chimneys once again. So, what I'm saying this morning is just keep walking. Walk away from pain into purpose. Walking from frustration into faith. Walking from longing and lament into love. And that love includes the deep and constant love of a God who created you, a God who desires the very best for you, and a God who is consistently with you, regardless of what's happening in your life. Pam, can we put the 23rd Psalm back up on the screen? And I'm going to ask those in this place to simply stand. And I want us to read this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Just Keep walking.